Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna talk about stationarity and probability. So I've made this statement on Twitter before, I've kind of mentioned it, but I haven't explained in great depth, but without stationarity within your data, probability is completely worthless. So this is a pretty big statement. Um, it's somewhat shocking because a lot of people take, you know, probability courses, and a lot of times you don't cover stationarity, or if you're like me, right, you took a few classes and you keep seeing stationarity pops up, and it's like a two-liner in the book that says, you know, like, Stationarity is required. Uh, there's strong stationarity, which is all moments of a function have to be you know, constant across time. And then you have some other sort that's like a weak stationarity, which is typically just your mean and variance, though you could go on to other moments. So mean and variance is that common weak stationarity format, right? All we're stating here is that the mean and the variance are going to be relatively stable or constant across time. So how does this play into probability? And then at the end of this, we're gonna talk a little bit how this plays into finance and specifically uh, stochastic processes, which are time series, which is what the whole foundation of finance is kind of resting on. Um, but let's dive into this real quick here. So let's say that you have 10 balls, okay? Um, you have five balls that are red, five balls that are blue, and they're inside of, I don't know, some sort of hat or like a bucket or a box here. And we're just gonna pull out balls at random, right? We already know though from this population that we have a 50% chance of getting red, 50% chance of getting blue. Um, we can do this through different types of methods. So let's think about you know the balls as all 10 balls of being your entire space, right? The probability space here. This is everything, right? There's nothing more in the universe. There's just 10 balls. So we can do sampling. So you can do sampling with replacement and you can pull a sample of some sort. So let's say we do bootstrapping here. We're gonna pull a ball and we're gonna replace it and we're gonna pull a ball and we're gonna replace it and we're gonna do this again, let's say a thousand times or a hundred times. So theoretically, right, let's say those 10 balls is really like, I don't know, 10 million balls or something, but you would go through and you'd pull a ball and say, okay, it's red, put it back. You pull another ball, it's red, you put it back. You pull another ball, it's blue, you put it back. Pull another ball, it's red, you put it back, right? You keep doing this and as you continually do this and the number of sampling increases, so as n increases, n being the number from the sample, um, you're gonna converge to the essential true population, the true probability here, and that true probability is going to be 50-50. So 50% chance of red, 50% chance of blue. So this is a stationary process because the space itself is stable. Now, where non-stationarity and where the problem comes in is, let's say that we have a black box, okay? And I'm not gonna tell you what's in the black box and we're gonna end up putting in, there's red balls and blue balls, we know that. And we're gonna go in and we're gonna sample from that, right? We don't know it's 50-50 and we're gonna have to do that same process as before where we reach in, we pull out one of them, we sample it, we say, okay, you know, it's red. We sample again, it's blue, it's blue, it's blue, it's blue, it's red, right? We're gonna go through this process, we're gonna keep sampling. And let's say we end up with some sort of probability here, which is gonna say, I don't know, it's 20% blue, 80% red, and based on that, right, we can figure out this distribution from sampling from the black box. Um, again, let's say there's 10 million balls. There's no way we're gonna go through and sample 10 million of these for a variety of reasons, right, constraints in the real world. And so, right, we're just gonna do some sort of sampling. Now let's say we have a black box and we pull balls from this and we get some sort of distribution and we think that we know the distribution, okay? But the thing is, is as we keep pulling samples, it's not converging. So let's say we start pulling balls and I don't know, we get to 100 balls and it looks like it's going to be 50-50, right? 50 red, 50 blue. And then we keep pulling and pulling and all of a sudden now it looks like we're getting all reds. So we're getting into the state where it looks like, okay, it's like 90% red, 10% blue. And we keep pulling and pulling and pulling and let's say we pull another, I don't know, 10,000 pulls and all of a sudden we're converging to something that's like, I don't know, 35% blue, and then, you know, 65% red. So we keep pulling and pulling. The distribution is changing. We're not getting some sort of convergence here. And this is the, the principle of stationarity. And one of the issues in you know, probability theory is that we just assume some sort of sampling or distribution, it's constant, and that makes a lot of sense for hard sciences. So you think like physics, biology, um, I don't know, all these chemistry, all these things, you're gonna have some sort of stable distribution, you have some sort of population, the more you pull, the closer you get to it. Now the problem with soft sciences, so soft sciences would be like psychology a lot of times, or like economics, sociology, right, where people are interacting and making decisions, a lot of times there's not an equilibrium, 
There's not some sort of distribution that we're going to converge to. And in that last example I'm talking about, right, we're converging on something, we think we have it nailed down, and all of a sudden we start pulling more and it's all of a sudden deviating in one direction. So you could say, okay, well, based on probability theory, we assumed that, you know, it's stationary, that we didn't say that. And then what ends up happening is that, you know, we say, okay, we're only gonna pull 1,000 and that's gonna be our sample. And you end up with one distribution. But if you pulled 10,000, you ended up with a different distribution, right? Now imagine this black box here, we're gonna end up doing the pulling, but I'm gonna actually peek inside that box and show you something different here. Let's say that there's actual two distributions inside this box. So let's say there's a normal distribution and there's a log distribution. Let's say the normal distribution has a mean of five and let's say the log distribution has a mean of, I don't know, 15. So they're definitely different. If I go in and I pull in the black box like in financial theory, a lot of times there's different distributions across time because that distribution is actually morphing and changing across time because people are changing how they interact. And there's so many variables out there that while we're pulling from one specific data source, the sample we're trying to figure out the probability of, let's say it's a stock price, for example, we start getting some intuition behind it. And then all of a sudden we realize something's not quite right. And as time passes and we do enough gap in time, we're in sampling here. So you can completely ignore time. Let's just say we're sampling. You keep sampling. Um, you're gonna end up with something different. So imagine now inside this black box, you have these two distributions, right? And let's say I'm gonna start pulling, but I'm gonna pull at random between both of them, 50-50. So now I have a probability layered on the distributions here. Um, those would converge because we have two sets of probabilities. If you pull from each of them equally, we'll end up with some sort of distribution that will converge, which would be the combination of the two. Now the issue here within finance, as I mentioned, behaviors change. What this means is typically in finance we view things as time. So let's say we look at time and we end up saying, okay, if time is going to be within some time frame, I pull from the normal distribution. Sorry, so I'm pulling from that. When you sample, you're gonna converge to that and your models are gonna make sense only in that frame. Nothing's going to alert you and say, hey, Dimitri, after this time point, we're gonna to switch to the log normal distribution, right? The log distribution here. So all of a sudden we're sampling from the log, right? We don't know that. And all of a sudden, when you start adding small samples from the log into that normal, you're not gonna know. It, it looks the same. But you have to do enough sampling and enough robustness to all of a sudden realize we have a different distribution. And the issue is, is now the combination of normal and log in that example, in that black box, starts to create a different distribution, which is the merger of the two. But realistically, we're transitioning into that other one. And now to look at this from a more realistic standpoint, let's say there's 100 or 1,000 different distributions of data inside that black box. And as I'm sampling out, what ends up happening is I never converge because I don't know which distribution I'm sampling from. I don't know what time frame it goes into. And so everything kind of melts down. This is the key point here with stationarity in probability theory. Probability theory lays out very clearly, right? They have this you know, full set of all possible observations, right? You have your probability space. And then you go in and you take samples and based on, you know, essential statistics and probability theory, right? As you continually do this, we will converge and that makes a lot of sense. But it completely ignores the fact of stationarity. And that's fine for most things in science. But when you get to finance and other social sciences, humans aren't necessarily rational or there's millions of variables, family considerations, independent interactions individuals have. These all affect the way we think, the decisions we make, every single day. And because of that, that will impact how the distribution is put together. So that's something that you need to think about and realize that you need stationarity to do any sort of probability theory. And that goes into Brownian motion, that goes into you know derivative pricing, that goes into stock pricing, probability, probability, probability. And even if you look at models, so you can bring up someone who'll say, hey, Dimitri, what about Markov models, right? They don't predict the past. And that brings up a good point here, right? Um, Probability is always based on the past. It's backwards looking because it's assuming you have that stationary data set. If that's, you know, that population we're sampling from, if that population is always the same, we're always sampling from that, it doesn't matter the past or the future. And you can use things like Markov chains, where again, your point in time has no meaning. It doesn't matter. That relationship's going to be there. The issue with that occurs when more or less, right, it's changing all the time. So Markov models will also fail because there's nothing to sample from. There's no way to establish some sort of relationship, some sort of model. And so you end up with that conundrum again that you need stationarity to do anything in probability and statistics, as we've talked about in the past. Uh, it's crucial. And then to wrap this up here with kind of an example of this, and I'll show you 
a little bit of what I'm thinking here. Uh, let's say that you have a coin toss. We're going to talk about uh, stock price movements here. So let's say if I flip a coin and if it's heads, so I do have a coin here, a quarter. So this is a fair quarter, right? It's a quarter, heads on one side, tails on the other. But let's say I flip this coin and if it's heads, the stock goes up by a dollar. And if it's tails, it goes down by a dollar, okay? Uh, we can do that and we can figure out essentially, right, some side of some sort of stock movement. When you start modeling stocks, a lot of time you have what is called drift. So drift means that, right, stock market in general is moving upwards. We're drifting in one direction, typically up. If you have a crisis or typically drifting down. Uh, if you have that drift, what that means is that this coin is no longer going to be 50-50. So we're gonna have to add some sort of adjustment to it so that we get more heads than tails. But let's just go back to the simple concept here of uh, heads and tails. So let's say it's up a dollar, down a dollar. And let's say that we're gonna do some sort of bet here. So this is more or less like a option here. Let's say if the stock price goes up by, I don't know, say if we can get six heads in a row, right? That's gonna be 1.5625% probability. So it's extremely rare. Let's say I put a massive bet on, so you land a million dollars. You'll give me, as a subscriber, a million dollars if I can do this. Uh, and I'll give you a million dollars if you can't do this. So again, it's all hypothetical, right? No actual contracts here. Um, but let's take this quarter here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip it. It's going to land. And I'm going to go over and you're going to look at it. Okay. Let's see if I can do this with this camera. If not, I'll add a secondary shot here. But we'll flip it. All right. So we'll flip it here. And I'll flip it over. And you can see it's a heads. But I'm going to do this six times. And I have two heads now in a row. Okay. I have three heads in a row. Four heads in a row. Five heads in a row. Six heads in a row. So I did it, right? I made it. Now you're starting to wonder, right? How is this possible? Well, I didn't tell you something, okay? Right? This is a fair coin, but actually no magic trick. So I can actually control the outcome of the coin toss. So this is like financial markets in a lot of ways. There are pieces that you don't see, information that you don't have that other people have inside of there. And being weary of that, so you think, for example, you start sampling, you look at your data, even if you get some sort of stationary process, you think it's coming from a distribution here, and you end up saying, okay, I've got it, I've got it all figured out, I'm gonna use that model. You need to be extremely cautious, you need to dig as deep as you can, look at different angles of the data, which is one of the pieces, just adding on here at the end here. I don't see a lot of this happening in the industry, hedge funds, trading firms, banks, you know, large financial services institutions here. The, a lot of times the games don't work the way you think the games work based on simple, simple data analytics. And this is a big warning for you know data science as well as statistics here, which is you don't fully understand that. So when I, right, we go through that fake bet I give you here, you don't know that I can control the outcome of this coin, right? And in markets here, a lot of times there are different participants that have different leverages. So for example, some massive fund, they can cut deals, for example, behind closed doors, like dark pools, for example, or if they just have a bigger position, they can move the book, again, which is illegal here, but it happens. There are unfair advantages across trading platforms and institutions here. So thinking about this from a perspective, you're right, don't always rely on the data 100%. You do need to dig on different angles from it. So don't just take a sample, think that's good enough and just do it. Be very weary of probability theory. Again, understand stationarity to its core. Try to look at from a risk perspective the way I think about things, which is, where can I go wrong? Where can this thing fail? And even if you build a model, it's never gonna be perfect, right? Models are just approximations to reality. We're never gonna be able to calculate it here for stock pricing, for example, and you know finance in general, and so social sciences and soft sciences. But you need to look at it and say, okay, this is the model. These are the weaknesses we have. This is where it can fail and build some sort of plan to monitor those weaknesses so you can see when it starts to fail. So that example here we talked about, right? Having two distributions in a black box, we think it's normal when we started here. When it starts deviating, we can at least start getting an idea if something's going on here. How do we model that? How do we be careful? Maybe we reduce our positions here if you're trading. Um, if you're a bank here, let's say you're making, I don't know, loans or something, you can go back and say, why don't we start looking at building a new model, trying to figure out where we're headed here and try to nail down a backup plan for when that fails. So anyways, I hope you guys learned a little bit more about stationarity impacting on probability theory. Um, also, markets aren't necessarily what you think they are. A lot of times there are different players in the game that have different points of leverage. 
and you're not gonna know that. So again, you're not gonna know the distribution while the data says one thing, someone might be able to kind of fudge it. Again, they're not gonna be able to do like me and bang out you know six different heads here in a row, but there's going to be different points and pieces in the markets that aren't fully fair as you kind of would expect, at least what you get from a kind of, I don't know, educational perspective here. So anyways, thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.